So you're part of the Power Up Your Pantry Fall 2020 webinar series, a conversation about burnout, checking in, not checking out. This is our first session in a six week series. Today, Carrie's going to be talking with us about understanding and identifying burnout. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about some future webinars here a little bit later in this intro. So in terms of housekeeping, I wanna make sure everybody knows that this is being recorded. We plan to edit this down just a little bit, kind of trim off the front and the back, put this on our website so that folks can refer back to it. People who weren't able to be here live can uh, basically attend the webinar. Uh, the sessions will be interactive, so Carrie will be leading us through various polls and chats and breakout rooms, so be prepared for that. All of the workshop materials that Carrie mentions, including the videos, will be posted on our Power Up Your Pantry conversation about burnout webinar page, and we'll be sure to share that link with you quite often. In terms of the sponsorship, so this series is sponsored by Power Up Your Pantry, which is a program of the MU Interdisciplinary Center for Food Security. We're being supported by New Chapter Coaching, who Carrie works with out of Columbia, Missouri. And funding for this project comes from a grant through the Missouri Foundation for Health. Been part of a two-year grant. It's getting ready to conclude at the end of January. We have various social media handles. So by all means, check us out on Facebook, either Power Up Your Pantry or New Chapter Coaching. Also, if you're into Twitter, which is something I'm learning more about these days, the Center for Food Security at MU has a Twitter account as well. And in terms of this whole series, we do want to provide you with an overview. So I mentioned that this will be a six week series and the format is somewhat unique in that every other week, Carrie is going to be leading us through discussions about burnout. And you can see in session one, three and five, Carrie is basically in charge of those. And we are in good hands uh, with Carrie at the helm there. And then every other week, you'll see sessions two, four, and six. These are gonna actually be discussions. And so I'm going to open up the Zoom link. I will have a few guiding questions for folks. And really the goal is to have a discussion with you all about some of the changes and the struggles and the opportunities, maybe even the silver linings of running a food pantry during COVID-19. And so by all means, feel free to join all of these sessions, feel free to pick and choose, but we do want to kind of at least present you with that, this outline so that you know kind of what's in store with this series. And with that, I'm going to mute myself and hand it over to Carrie. So Carrie, go ahead. Thanks, Bill, and thanks everyone. I was trying to admit people as they were coming in. So thank you all for joining this morning. I'm Carrie Collier, as Bill said, with New Chapter Coaching. And as you can see, I'm joining you from my home. I am primarily working from home during the pandemic. I have two kiddos here and we will hope that they stay on their school upstairs, but I have a cat as well. And we just never know what kind of uh, interruptions we might all have. So thank you for <laughs> I am here. I've been an associate with New Chapter Coaching for about a year now. And prior to that, I was actually at the University of Missouri for 10 years. And my background is in leadership development, counseling and coaching, um, well-being. And I have particular interest in well-being, inclusion, diversity, equity, Clifton strengths. Um, so I've worked in academics. I've worked in business. I started my career working in nonprofits. Um, and I'm happy to be a part of the new chapter coaching team. Um, our mission is to build a better world by increasing the effectiveness of nonprofit leaders and the impact of the organizations they serve, you all, and um, what you all do. 
And we work with nonprofits on a variety of things. We do individual coaching as well as leadership roundtable. We do consulting on things like strategic planning, crisis planning, succession planning, executive transition management. So those are some of the activities that we're currently engaged in with clients during the pandemic um, and were before as well. And now we do most of them virtually. We do a lot of trainings um, like this. We do workshops, skill-based trainings, team building, primarily using Clifton Strength. So um, if you have any questions about anything, please reach out at any time. I would be happy to talk with you. But like I said, I joined the new chapter coaching team about a year ago, um, and I've been doing these workshops on burnout for a while now and started doing them about a year ago. And, and honestly, so my primary interest in doing them was one, I started seeing it more and more in my career, in career development, leadership coaching. Um, and frankly, I have experienced the symptoms of burnout and have worked myself to both change and make shifts in my career and personal life to both reverse it and help prevent it in the future. So just seeing the prevalence of it was really um, inspiring to me to try to do more with it. So um, I'm hoping this will be a helpful tool for you today. We're gonna talk about burnout, identifying it, and then we'll move on in future sessions to more about how to address it when you see it, um, either in yourself or others, and then what, more about what we can do with it. Although I'll put a few nuggets of that in today. But enough about me, let me ask you all, why are you here? So I've got a poll that I'm going to launch right here. It's actually, two questions in one is what brings you you here and I noticed there's a typo on that but what brings you here I'm concerned about burnout four so that was probably my typo my bad right there um, and you have to pick one although you may be concerned about it for everything my staff my volunteers my board um, go ahead and vote if you can see the polls and also tell us about what um what are you learning about? We're going to address all these topics, but it's really helpful to know a little bit more from you all. So I'll give it just a few more seconds until at least half of you have voted. Oh, they're coming in. I've got about a third of the votes coming in and um, the results are interesting. Seeing a lot of, um, I'm worried about burnout for myself. Yeah. And a lot about how to prevent burnout and build resilience. Good. Okay. So I'm going to give us about five more seconds. And then I'm going to end the polling and show you all the results so you can see what people are interested in here today. All right, I'm going to share the results and you can see um, a lot of you. And this is again, why I started doing this myself. I felt like I was getting burnt out being in helping professions, counseling and coaching and working with, with clients. It was exhausting. That's absolutely a good reason to be here. And then um, I think a lot of us probably would say the entire world too, but you could only pick one. And then you're interested in learning about how to prevent and build resilience. We will get to that. And like I said, I, that's what usually people are really interested in. So I'll drop just a few nuggets of that in today. Um, but another goal of this is how to connect with other food banks and how they're doing. And we'll start doing some of that today. All right. Thank you for engaging right away. And I am now going to, um, oh, I'm not going to stop the share results again. Move us on to the next part, which is getting present for today. So I know that this can seem really <laughs> cheesy in some ways, but it's also, I think, really important, especially when we have all these distractions from home. And like I said, I don't expect anyone to not have distractions given what we're going through right now. But I want to bring us back to a tool. And this is right away the building resilience tool right here. Um, something we have immediate access to all the time, and that's our breath. So you probably know this, but a reminder that when we do it properly, it can make the difference between panic and resilience. So research has actually shown that different emotions are associated with different forms of breathing, right? So when you're feeling anxious or angry, your breath is more shallow and quick. But when you're feeling joy or relaxation, your breath tends to be more slow and, and regular. So one thing we can do is trick our brains actually in our bodies into experiencing some of those emotions by changing our breathing. So we're going to do that today. We're going to focus on the out breath because when we breathe in, our heart rate goes up. But when we breathe out, um, we start to slow it down. So we're going to change the ratio of our inhale to exhale. And I find that just doing three breaths at a time can really um, help with bringing us in more into the present. And 
shifting from whatever we've been doing before to being right here where we are right now, which is a big tool to helping prevent resilience or to prevent burnout and building resilience. So with that, I'm going to invite you to um, three breaths with me. We're going to breathe in for four and breathe out for eight. And if you want to close your eyes, please do so. But here we go. Ready? Here we go. In two, three, four. Out two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In two, three, four. Out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In, two, three, four. Out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Go ahead and when you're ready, open your eyes and come back to the room, whatever room you're in, to be present with us here and join us on our journey of identifying um, and addressing, uh, beginning to address burnout. And um, the first step is validating. Yeah, you're not alone. You already saw a lot of you are coming to this to figure out how to deal with burnout for yourself. We're going to define it. What is it really? And then what's it look like? And how does it differ from stress in particular? And what is pandemic burnout? And does it really matter if there's a difference? Um, because it, but then we'll also talk about why it does matter that we're talking about this. So let's get started, as I said, on this journey together. Thanks for being present and with me. Number one, you are not alone. Keeping that in mind, clearly from the poll, burnout is something that people are concerned about, right? Even before the pandemic, burnout was everywhere. These were just some articles I had grabbed last year um, and some headlines about burnout. And in fact, it became so intense in 2019 that World Health Organization declared it an occupational um, phenomenon and its global, global standards, um, including it in their international classification of diseases, the ICD. And then these were just some headlines I grabbed in the past couple of days. I just did a search and found all these things about pandemic burnout. It's real. People are feeling it. There's so much going on. So how does knowing this help? How does knowing that you're not alone help? Well, I think it helps to normalize it and to know that before the pandemic, um, two thirds of workers had, oops, actually said that, uh, this is what happens when I've got all these things up. Two thirds of workers had said that they were feeling more burnt out than they did five years ago. And 95% of human resource uh, workers said that burnout was sabotaging workplace retention, primarily because of heavy workloads. I mean, how many of you feel overworked and felt overworked before the pandemic started? Yeah. And now during the pandemic, our life ratings have plummeted to a historic, almost historic low, matching that of the financial crisis in 2008, 2009, which was a historic low. Workers are now more than three times as likely to report poor mental health, which is associated with burnout. 42% say stress levels are very high, not higher, but very high. And 40% say they've experienced burnout. That's like almost half. So it's a big deal. So what I am wondering, what's your experience been both before and during the pandemic? So one of the things that is a goal of this series is to get you talking to each other. And as you said, figure out what other food pantries are doing. So this is our first foray into that experience, getting you to introduce yourselves to each other and see what did you notice prior to the pandemic? And what do you feel like was, were you already worried about burnout for yourself and others? And then what have you noticed since the pandemic, either for staff members, volunteers, people working in your food bank, um, maybe the boards, are you concerned they're reaching burnout or are they already, are they, are they approaching it already there? And how can you tell? So I want you to, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms here in just a minute, and I'll probably have you in about groups of four to five. Um, and that way, if like sometimes I do on a webinar, I'm on, but I'm not on, someone's not in your room, um, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and introduce yourselves to those who are already in there and then share some responses to these questions. So you may want to jot the questions down or take a picture of this or a screenshot because you won't be able to see it when you go in. So take just a minute, do that. If you need to uh, turn your video on, go ahead and get prepared, but I'm going to put you in breakout rooms. You'll have about five minutes and then you'll get a one minute warning broadcast message when it's time to come back.
And if you have any questions, you can come back and ask, or you can ask the host to come into your breakout room, and we're happy to do that. Um, the other thing that I would say is I would ask if someone in your group wouldn't mind taking down some of the responses that you all come up with. Thinking about um, writing those down in the chat when you come back would be really helpful. You can't type it in the chat in your breakout room because it'll go away, but if you type it in the chat when you come back to the main room, we can talk about it just a little bit. Okay, hopefully you've all had a chance to get ready. I'm about to put you into breakout rooms, introduce yourselves and just talk about what you noticed before and during regarding concern about burnout in your organizations. Three, two, one. I'm opening the rooms. Go ahead and join the room. Hi everyone, Wait, welcome back. I know that was not near long enough, um, and I appreciate you taking the time to get to know each other and talk with each other a little bit in there, even though, I, uh, again, I know it wasn't long enough, but if you wouldn't mind sharing someone, some of the things you talked about in the chat box, that would be fantastic. Would love to hear um, and see some of the things you talked about, what you've noticed, things you've been concerned about at your organizations, things you've um, seen or been wondering and could share a little bit of those. Because again, um, you're not alone. There's a lot of stress to go around uh, that is going around and a lot of people are feeling strapped and like their situations are untenable. So um, thanks for chatting with each other. You will have another chance to chat with each other just a little bit later. But if anyone, I think I see people typing furiously. So I'll wait just a moment. See if anyone puts anything in the chat about what you've noticed. Oh, okay, so we've got the theme in our group is unable to serve because of COVID. Staff is stressed to cover the activities. Absolutely, volunteers, huge issue with volunteers. That's really stressful, as if you weren't already overworked. Um, and then now you have to cover the shifts of volunteers and or lessen your services, provide less food, which is stressful and doesn't feel good because you've gone into this to help people. So you were noticing this, um, people are COVID fatigue, it's real, um, personally feeling more stressed, trying to take care of yourself, your staff, all the people. Yeah, frustration, like not being able to bring kids with them. I have that. My kids and I used to go volunteer and do buddy packs at the local food pantry, and we can't do that. And I have to figure out a way that I can do that without them or, you know, trouble shifting gears. Oh, boundaries. Yeah, for, that's a huge thing. Um, working from home can be more stressful for yourself and for your staff, connecting with your staff um, or your volunteers, staying connected when we're isolated. So yeah, you, you can see these, are, you're not alone. You've noticed these. And many of these were probably happening. Um, there were other things happening before the pandemic and now you've got these happening that add on to the stressors. So hopefully you got a chance to talk about at least what you're dealing with to know you're not alone. I know we haven't gotten to what you do to deal with that yet, um, but we will get there and talk more about that with in here and with within each other. But you're already identifying the signs of burnout, right? Um, tell me, what do you think? Do you all think that stress and burnout are the same thing? Um, because we talk about stress a lot and we talk about um, burnout, but what do you think? Are they the same thing? Just do a quick yes or no vote. Mm. All right, I'm gonna end this because it's coming in pretty quickly. You're right, and stress can lead to burnout, but it is not the same as burnout. So what's the difference here? Um, stress has many definitions. Original definition actually um, was a very physical response to stress and a demand for change on the body. Here's the 2020 dictionary definition where they add in physical, chemical, or emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension and maybe a factor in disease causation, right? Stress leads to burnout, which we'll talk about, um, which then can become a disease as classified in the new ICD. And then the authors of this book, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle, called it the neurological and physiological shift that happens in your body when you encounter stressors. So what's a stressor? A stressor is a thing that causes stress. It causes the release of stress hormones. This is the definition of it. So 
two categories, physiological and psychological. Those are the physiological things, the things that put stresses on our body, pain response, um, sick response. It's that ancestor's response of ours that saw the tiger, had a flood of hormones um, released and then ran, right? But there's a psychological stressors are well as well, which is what we think of a lot today, right? Things like too much work, financial stress, sick family members. But the interesting thing is that stress hormones are also released in positive events. There are things like a flow state that work that's actually a positive stress release or where you get a stress um, event where you're releasing hormones in response to feeling really good and excited about what you're doing. And it's the same thing with exercise. We release hormones when we exercise that are positive. We know that. So stressors and stress are a natural part of life. And I want you to keep this in mind because we're going to come back to this when we talk about developing resilience and how we deal with stressors. But um, the original definition of burnout talked about stress on helping professionals, actually related specifically to helping professionals like you all, which I thought was interesting because this was something we talked about because burnout is a special kind of work-related stress. And here's the World Health Organization's definition of it. And we talked about, they created an actual category for it. Um, chronic workplace stress that hasn't been successfully managed. And then there was a book called The Happy Healthy Nonprofit, which I'll talk a little bit about throughout this series. And they call it a state of emotional, mental, and physical exhaustion. When we feel overwhelmed by too many demands, right? We have too much to do, as you all noted, too few resources, not enough volunteers, not enough staff, not enough time, not enough money, and too little recovery time. It's that running from the tiger, and yet you you don't see the tiger anymore, so you stop. So you're recovering, you're catching your breath, your body is rebuilding its strength. Oh, but wait a second, you see that tiger again, so you run again, and what happens? You can't run as far, you can't run as fast. Um, you're more and more tired because you haven't had enough time to recover, so you stop. And you think, okay, whew, tiger's gone. But then that tiger 30 seconds later is there again, and you've got no reserves left. What do you do? You don't have anything left. You haven't had enough time to recover. And it's not just the physical recovery. It's the emotional and mental recovery that we don't get when we're burned out. Stress, again, it's a biological response. It's a natural part of life caused by stressors in short bursts. That's positive or negative long burst and it's inevitable, but burnout is not inevitable caused by the prolonged stress response. And it's a generally, it's a negative thing, right? It, we don't have time to recover. So I bring this up so we can refer back to this throughout our series when we're talking about how to address stress and burnout and what those differences are. You probably already know these um, signs and I'll talk about them briefly, but um, I bring them here because it's important to recognize them, particularly in the aggregate when you start to see all these um, signs together, physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral. They can all be representative of other issues or challenges or things people are experiencing. But when you put these all together, these are the signs that you see when people are starting to or experiencing burnout. The first are those physical signs. And these are the ones you might notice before you even really know you're burnt out. For me, it was, I had so many sinus infections. I was always feeling sick. I was run down all the time. My stomach would hurt. I had more back pains than usual. I wasn't sleeping well, or I felt so tired like I could sleep 12 hours. All of these changes in our physical well-being. Then we've got this, this cognitive piece, which I think is sort of harder sometimes to oh, identify, but it's that struggling to make decisions or difficulty concentrating. Um, it's where we're distracted, which is happening a lot right now, um, but it's also an inability to sort of think through and embrace complexity, which is what you have to do a lot of times to solve these complex problems. And we're just not able to do that or even remember as effectively because we're so distracted. Then we've got these, um, you know, these pieces, the emotion pieces, the, the failure, the self-doubt, feeling hopeless or trapped or defeated, right? Um, maybe you used to be a positive person and now you're starting to really feel um, detached and like you are cynical. If you used to be positive, um, we're not satisfied with our work and with our life. And then these behavioral signs that we see, which often we notice in others, withdrawal, which is easier to do as well as isolating yourself. Even if you're a person who is an introverted and likes to be alone, it's forced on us now. 
and it might make people more irritable, um, procrastination on big projects. And then talk about checking, checking in and not checking out food, alcohol, drugs, those are one of the big ways that people have checked out. I mean, we've seen in the pandemic in particular, alcohol sales have risen. People have talked about comfort eating. And while those can help, I mean, sometimes not be entirely harmful done to the extreme, they absolutely can be. And they check out, you're checking out instead of checking in with yourself around what's going on for you. So as we're putting these things together um, and we're identifying signs of burnout, what do you think are the easier or the more difficult ones to recognize um, in yourself and or others? So you can answer this either for yourself or for others, but what do you think is easiest and what do you think are the hardest to spot or identify? And I ask you, oh, you want to launch this, don't you? Um, okay, there, I've launched it. So now you can respond. And I ask this so that one, you can be aware because sometimes we think, oh, you know, they're just, they've got stuff going on, right? They, maybe they're checking out or maybe they have this, right? But as we think about putting them all together, as I said, what do you think? What are some signs that you see in yourself and others or things that you might want to see if you're not really looking for them to be on the lookout for? Okay, we've got about half of you voted and it's been about 30 seconds. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and show you these results. It looks like as you, many of you are saying, um, the behavioral ones, those things where people are irritable, they're maybe they used to be positive or they're procrastinating. Um, there are also some of those um, things like eating more, drinking more, sleeping less. The ones that are maybe harder, yeah, I agree. The cognitive ones tend to really be harder to spot because we're also distracted with so many things. It's harder to sort of problem solve and think big, but keeping an eye out for those, especially when combined for the others can be really, really helpful as you're thinking about identifying for yourself or others. Is that person really, are we really approaching burnout? Let me look at all these different things that are going on. What have I noticed? And you all identified it a lot of that already. And then we've got this pandemic, right? We've talked about this already, but um, people have talked about COVID fatigue. Um, we're tired of the communication challenges, the constant uncertainty that we have, inability to plan. Oh, you wanna do strategic planning for your organization? Good luck with that, right? It feels like we don't know what's going to happen next month. If there will be a vaccine next year, if our kids will go back to school. So it feels like we can't plan and that makes people uh, really struggle, right? If we, if we have, feel a lack of control of so many things, we're isolated more than we used to be. We're confined in different ways. We can't do the same things that we used to do. Oh, and while we're here, maybe we're watching the news more and seeing things about the political divides and racial injustices, and we don't know how to help with that, or we feel like we're ineffective in helping with some of that. Um, and in fact, it's been noted that the research has shown that people who watch the news more during this time are actually more unhappy than those who don't watch it as much. So our need to stay connected and involved and see what's going on, but also like not overwhelming ourselves so much that we can't recover. The non-existent boundaries and the constant juggling of responsibilities. So many of you said that work and home lines are blurred. We didn't just shift to a remote work. We shifted this emergency paradigm shift to work from home, which is different. And people don't really like forced change in general. And then we have a lot of it all at once. And it's not like we're working in a coffee shop, which might be fun. Most of them are closed. We're at home where there's additional stressors and we're more worried about our health, our health, the health of others, our finances and continued concerns about what our future looks like, giving people more anxiety and a sort of unprecedented instability. To add that to your, um, our society, particularly US ideals about working and we are our work and working more means we're better. And then in nonprofits, this sort of attitude of low pay, make do and do without culture. They talk about that a lot in the Happy Healthy Nonprofit book that I would recommend any of you take a look at if you get a chance. Um, we have this myth of being indispensable. If we can't do it, no one else can. And sometimes it's not a myth, right? Sometimes you are filling a niche and no one else is there. And if you don't get food, someone will not get it if you don't get it out. So there are real, um, real stressors here too, but also that constant pressure of that the nonprofit uh, sector is just sort of overwork, stressful work and information overload all the time. 
I don't know about you, but a lot of you and a lot of people that I work with, um, and I know myself in many cases, and this is how I got to the place of feeling like I was really burned out, our response is to use busyness. Let's just do more and be more, and we'll give everything we have to everybody, which can lead to more burnout. Anyone found they've done that? I see a few head nods, yeah. It's like, okay, we're gonna make every plan we can. We're gonna do everything we can. We're gonna talk more about self-compassion as a tool for building resilience. I see some yeses coming through. Yeah, I'm just gonna stay busy and I'm gonna get it all done. And then I'm not gonna forgive myself when I don't do it all, which is gonna to continue to make me work harder. Frankly, that doesn't actually make you work harder. Research, particularly the work of Dr. Kristen Neff on self-compassion has shown a much better tool for uh, building resilience is to give ourselves the compassion that we would give to others and to ask what's good for you right now is getting a little more rest good for you right now and if that's what it is to listen to that voice and give some um, give attention to that voice so we'll come back to that but just so you know um, you're not alone these are things you're, I'm sure you're already identifying and you're noticing and you're seeing um, and that it's real. And whether it's pandemic induced burnout, the signs are the same. So keeping an eye out for those signs and especially if it's in yourself. Um, yeah, I didn't hear people saying I have much more compassion for others than I do myself. Yeah, that's pretty common, especially in the kinds of work you all are doing. But it's important to remember this. So we will come back to that. So why does it why does it matter? You're probably already getting some inklings of this, but people who are burned out, right? Employees are more likely to take um, sick days if they're feeling or approaching burnout. 63%, and this was prior to the pandemic. And now we know if we even have a sniffle, we should stay home. But I, like I said, I got constant sinus infections. And so I was calling in sick and I felt guilty about it, which made me feel even worse. Half as likely to discuss um, their performance goals, which means our performances are reduced, right? Our productivity is reduced. 23% more likely to visit the ER. I went to the ER with an ear infection in the middle of the night from that sinus infection that turned into an ear infection. More likely to be looking for other jobs. And we're already struggling to staff what we have right now sometimes. So these are all real things that happen. In addition, that, that uh, lessened confidence that I mentioned, that's a real symptom of burnout. We don't feel good about ourselves and that makes us feel bad about what we're doing. And then we just have reduced confidence all over, which makes us actually not as good at our jobs. So who's most at risk? Those who identify strongly with their work. I am my work, my work matters. And that's important. It's important to have meaning and mattering from work. As a career development professional, I know that we uh, get joy and strive to have that but it also can be really harmful in some ways, especially if we're letting it spill over into our personal life, which again, without boundaries is happening, whether we want it to or not. Those who have a high workload, including overtime work, which is pretty common in your areas in food banks and in other nonprofits, um, pantries. I worked with Tiger Pantry at Mizzou quite a bit, and I know they were always working to try to meet deadlines and help people out as much as they could trying to be everything to everyone, little or no control over work. Again, we don't really like those forced changes and we've had a lot of them. Perfectionists, um, a lot of times I see head nods during this, like, oh yeah, that's that's me, um, and helping professions. So I think Pooh Bear has a lot of wisdom to offer. And in this one in particular, I love looking in the mirror, right? Oh, do any of those sound like me? Do any of those sound like my staff, people that I'm working with? Probably. That means we're more at risk. So being aware of that, um, especially when I know from the nonprofits I've worked with, you all are so mission driven. You want to do the best you can for everybody. And while I've never actually seen this mission statement, it is reminiscent of the people that I work with, right? Our goal at our organization is to create solutions for all of the problems, for all of the people. So we're just gonna keep working. We're gonna keep doing more and we're gonna do it but we're gonna care way too much. We're gonna work ourselves tirelessly because that's how we're gonna get better and doing more than anyone could ever imagine possible with very few staff, volunteers and probably not a lot of resources but we have so much heart so it's gonna work out. 
And and although I see some of you kind of snickering, right? How many of you sort of had that like thought in the back of your mind? I've worked with so many people and organizations that have so much heart and you want to give all you can, but you get to that point and you start experiencing, you've probably heard this compassion fatigue. And that is really hard, right? When what you wanted to give and why you have compassion for why you do this because you have compassion for others but you start to become exhausted by it, it can make you kind of cynical and then you can ex start to experience the trauma of others through what we call secondary trauma you can experience trauma without being traumatized but the more trauma you experience or the more you hear about it from others the more likely you are to be traumatized by it and that can lead to this double-edged sword of this meaningful work that you all are doing and balancing that managing compassion that you have to give with the finite energy that you have to give it it's not an infinite resource so we'll talk about how to help manage that infinite resource in times coming up. But one of the things we have to do is get more comfortable in talking about mental health. And this has gotten easier in the past few years, I think. Um, but it's still like, oh, I don't know how to talk about that. But you know what? All of the emotions happen. They're a normal part of human experience and they're not unavoidable. We're going to feel sad. We're going to feel angry. We're going to feel happy and joy, but not all the time. Um, they're happening if we want them to or not. And opening this conversation about mental health um, has real benefits. Employees and organizations who talk openly about mental health struggles, about the approaching burnout, they actually do better. Their organizations are better. That's probably easier to talk about than you think, um, even if it feels uncomfortable to start the conversation. But just asking, how are we doing? How's everybody's health doing mentally, physically, emotionally, checking in with people one-on-one -on -one and in groups. Talking about this is really helpful. So this is your next breakout session where I'm gonna ask you, what does that look like? We're nearing the end of here. So I'll give you another five or six minutes and then we'll come back and have a couple minutes for some questions and some wrap up at the end. But I want you once again, I'm gonna put you in smaller groups this time. So you have a little bit of time, a little bit more time to talk with people. Um, but again, if someone doesn't show up in your breakout room, just write down some of your thoughts to this. What conversations are you having or are you not having and what's maybe holding you back or how are they going? What are other people doing to bring up this how we're struggling in our workplaces. So I am going to, um, in just a minute, go ahead and get yourselves ready, whatever you need to do. Go ahead and create some more breakout rooms. Like I said, about two or three of you per breakout room. Um, and go ahead and have this conversation. And same thing, if you wouldn't mind having somebody write down some of the things you talked about, so we can share those in the chat when we get back, that would be great. So you got your screenshot, you got your picture, you got your questions, go meet some new people um, and talk about how are you talking about this? Ready? Here we go, about five minutes. Welcome back. Thanks for uh, chatting again. And, and once again, I know you probably didn't have enough time if we were doing this in person as we had planned to do at the beginning of this series. When Bill and I first started talking, we'd be in a room at our local uh, food bank and connecting with each other. So this is an attempt to recreate some of that interaction. So if you wouldn't mind sort of, and I'd ask you all to raise your hands and share. Um, if you want to do that, that would be great. But if you also want to top, type in the chat, what are you talking about or not talking about in terms of burnout at your organizations? And what's holding you back or inspiring you to talk about it? We've got missing the social conversations that would happen if we were working in the office. Yeah, so it's harder to bring up and just say, you know, I noticed you didn't look like you were feeling so well today. What's going on? Is everything okay? Just, you know, as you're getting coffee or passing by each other's offices or working together on a project or serving. Um, so many things there, right? We all agreed it's real, whether we want to admit it or not. We also agree the rewards of service are worth it. Okay. I have an amazing um, quote that a former participant shared with, uh, with Bill about how we look at 
the service and the rewards and we think about building our resilience based on our response um, about looking to the future. And I love that. So yeah, we'll talk about how to build resilience by sort of trying to see our stressors in ways and responding to stressors in ways that are more healthy. Um, we'll talk about it at individual and organizational levels. Oh, finding a way to take time off. Yes. And finding a way to give time off to employees too. Outside stressors following you to the pantry, right? Pantry stressors following you home, vice versa, the boundarylessness. We also mentioned um, talking about mental health, but what uh, they're preaching isn't what they're teaching. People, yeah, right? Saying that, I, I have seen that a lot, right? Organization says, well, we value employee health and wellness, but can you just do more and keep doing more and keep doing more, right? I've seen that so much. So it's that's one of the things too that we'll talk about, some of the things you can do as individuals to prevent resilience, but it's really hard or to, to promote resilience, but it's really hard to promote resilience and um, prevent burnout as individuals in a system that's dysfunctional. And that's something that's that we can we can only control what we have control over in our our own circle of influence. And so we'll talk about that too. Talking about mental health stuff, it feels personal, it feels too personal. That's what I hear a lot. Yeah. Um, if you're having a bad day, it can feel like you're bringing everyone else down. Anybody else feel like that too? Like you're not allowed to say, oh, actually it's sort of not great around here. My family lost it or my employees are struggling. Like it's just, it's hard to say that because it feels like one, maybe there's not enough time because you don't have that water cooler chat. Um, and you also don't have those connections. The time is limited um, and you're not having those connections. And it's, it's hard. Yes, but it is it is something that it is important to learn how to talk about um, and ask about it in ways that um, that are you know that are not like are you struggling with depression right now like that's not a way you want to approach it. But to ask people, hey, how are you doing? I want to know, and then really listen to their responses. That's different, um, and that's how we bring it up. Oh, how are you feeling physically? mentally, you know, how are things going? How are you doing? How's your concentration? Are you able to concentrate on this? What do, can I do to support you? Those are some of the different kinds of conversations that we need to be having around supporting mental health. So I appreciate all of you sharing. There's clearly a lot here um, and more to talk about. I encourage you in between now and our next session to take this nonprofit burnout assessment as a way to gauge for yourself and maybe in invite others in your organization to take it. Um, and if you want to bring it into a team meeting or something, it's not a clinical instrument, but it's a free instrument and assesses the three dimensions, which we'll talk more about next time of exhaustion, depersonalization, and lack of personal accomplishments. So that's a way to sort of get at talking about it for yourself and maybe for others. Um, and it's free. And the link is here and these will be posted, these slides will be posted so you'll be able to access it. So any questions? Ahas, <laughs> technology stress. You can type in the chat. Carol or Bill, did you see any questions that came up in your groups or anybody can, you can actually just uh, shout out if you have a question or thought or an aha. Validating. Carrie, the discussion and comment about taking time off Mm. I think is an interesting one. You know, yeah. I think culturally in the U.S., we don't do that as well as maybe other countries. Absolutely. And then you add the pandemic on top of that. And it seems like it's even harder to find the time, make the time to take time off. And so just wondering about tips or ideas for, you know, kind of getting some perspective on that and yeah. really trying to do that. Um, I would be happy to share some ideas. I'm curious if others have found ways to make that a priority for themselves. <laughs> I hear people laughing like, well, what am I going to take time off to do? Spend more time at home where I am already? But honestly, right, what can you do? Thinking of things sort of outside the box. Can you take a day trip to just be away? Can you put, I hear a lot of technology stress. 
take a break a day or two where you're just taking a break from the technology. Um, if you don't use your vacation time, uh, you're going to learn it. <laughs> Ask other departments to cover so I can catch up on laundry. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes just taking care of some of those things at home that maybe are facing you, but you can't get to every day. I find it to be really stressful to see piles of laundry around me that I'm like, okay, I can't deal with that until Saturday. But okay, maybe I'll take Friday off and see if I could do that on Friday. Taking it in small pockets of time can sometimes feel better. Um, and a way to sort of start getting at some of those little things to, and whether it's what, and listening to yourself, what do you need on that day? Do you need to just watch trash TV? Um, I have a client that does that. <laughs> uh, or do you need to go for a hike? What do you need? And listen to that voice. I, someone, I asked myself that and I said, you know what I want is to go to a beach <laughs> and go swimming all day and not have anyone ask me for anything. Well, I can't do that, but I can get elements of that. I can get, you know, try to find elements of being by myself. Um, could I ask someone to help me, you know, uh, so that I could have that not so many responsibilities. So what do you need? Ask yourself that and then make that a priority to ask for a day or a couple days off. One Other of the things that we talked about a lot. In our oh, sorry. Yeah, Carrie, um, Carrie, I have a question based yeah. on uh, um, one of our one of the things we talked about a lot in our group um, is how to establish boundaries when you're not at work, but you're mm -hmm. physically in your workspace because you're working from home. Um, yeah. And I feel like that might coincide with this a little bit because at the end of the day, you have that kind of mini vacation, you have that time off and, and how do you utilize it? How do you shut down in order to really restore yourself? Um, wasn't sure if I could just panel it with the group or what, but I think it's yeah. a good it is a good question. And I know, um, and that it's a struggle for some who are at home. I realize some of you are out in the, the field too, and sometimes it's bringing home um, the issues too. Um, but that boundary issue is definitely something I, that we will continue to talk about in the upcoming session, whether it's working from home, whether it's working in the office, um, whether it's working in your pantry with others and how to sort of try to create some of those boundaries for yourself from wherever you're working, because it is important. And um, I know that was kind of a non-answer right now because I know it's noon. And if some of you have to, to hop off, go for it. But it is important to think about that. And it's different if you're working from home versus if you're working in the pantry or, or in the food bank. Um, but there are some tips that I will share in terms of just things like try to put your workspace away, try to turn off the technology, things that we know, but it's helpful to be reminded of. Yeah. That's a great question. I know it's noon. Um, so if anyone needs to drop off, go ahead. I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes after noon if we need to close out, Bill. Sure, that's fine. Yeah, and then we can close out and I will then, oh, I'm reminding you to just remember that tool of just breathing from wherever you are. <clears throat> so, I will let Bill sort of close us out and then I'll stay around for a few more minutes if anyone has questions and I'll be back in a couple weeks too. Wonderful, thank you so much, Carrie. As we close out today, I wanna just first thank Carrie for an excellent presentation and discussion. And also just kind of remind folks again of how this series is going to go. This idea that Carrie's gonna be in charge of weeks one, three, and five. I'm going to be in charge of weeks two, four, and six. And those weeks two, four, and six are really meant to be a discussion. So um, if you have things that you'd like to talk about as it relates to running a food pantry during COVID-19 and some of the challenges you've encountered, maybe some of the successes you've had, then by, by all means, please do plan to join those conversations. Um, it'll be relatively informal. I'll have a couple of guiding questions and then we'll just, we'll chat. So uh, please do attend those if, if you think that it would be useful to you. And beyond that, I think that's it. Carrie, do we have additional slides here? 
No, nope, that's are... it. Until I'm just thanking yeah. everyone for joining us. This is how you can reach me if you want to reach out to me in particular, Carrie at newchaptercoach.com. Um, Bill can also put you in touch with me. Uh, and until we meet again, right? So we're, we talked about it. What's it look like? It's important, I think, to begin talking about it, to identify it and know it and just start those conversations. And then we can start really talking more about, well, what do we do when we see it happening, whether it's related to the pandemic or just our ongoing stressors of working in a an, um, food bank or pantry where we're currently, where we serve clients and it's stressful and it's hard all the time. And um, we'll talk about that as well as how to try to build resilience going forward. Great. Well, thank you, Carrie. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time today.